Welcome to the podcast. We talk about all the things that are hidden in the shadows. This is Isaac. And on this bonus episode, we are joined by a longtime friend of the show, uh, Chaz of the Dead. What's going on, Chaz? Hey, man. Thanks for having me back on. Glad to be here. And I think I was telling you earlier, uh, you probably have set the record for most times on our uh, podcast and even the lives as well. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Record setter, trend breaker. Uh, all of the above. <laughs> That's what I strive to be. <laughs> yeah. there, I think the reason why we brought you back is because you're telling us you wrote another book. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a, a new project out now that I'm uh, really passionate about. It's a, a book, but also a little bit of a, a historical preservation project. Um, and it's focused on a uh, a case here in my home state of Florida. Um, a case some people might be familiar with, the Betts Sphere case. And it's a, a pretty strange story. And it's one that, um, you know, I initially was just looking at as a passing interest and then kind of fell down that rabbit hole of high strangeness and ended up pursuing the uh, the project at a uh, greater length. I know, because you're always attached with aliens. Because I always know you as like my alien guy uh, when it comes to these conspiracies and stories and stuff like that. Uh, and then remember last we talked, we talked about the, the uh, theory of uh, honeycombs and, and, and the paranormal. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the bee theory. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was one of those cases that, um, again, kind of like the, the case I covered in my first book, the friendship case. It it had a little bit of everything. You know, it wasn't just this as as I examined it. It wasn't just this cut and dry oh, this family found a weird metal sphere and people thought it was a UFO. And wasn't that strange? It, it really was a, a story I discovered that had a lot more facets to it. And it's a story that's still um, unraveling today. It very much is relevant when it comes to our, our modern discourse, uh, especially when it comes to things like UFOs. And so, but the the first thing I noticed when I was researching this this case and specifically um, the house, well, I wanted to go out to this island where they discovered this this Bet Sphere. And for those who don't know, the Bet Sphere case uh, occurred uh, just north of Jacksonville, Florida, in 1974. Um, this family found this big metal sphere on Fort George Island and brought it to their home on that same island. And um, there's mixed reports. Some say they found it in a circle of, of burning um, shrubs and plants. Um, though one of the family members is on the record of saying he just found it like it was placed there. Later on, they would go back to this location and see a, a circle of dead foliage, dead trees. It seemed like there was kind of an, an impact um, from this sphere. But they brought it home initially thinking it was a historical artifact. And as we'll get into, there's a lot of reasoning for that because this island has a, a very long history. Uh, maybe a cannonball or something like that. But it was a little too shiny and a little too new looking to fit any of these these ideas. And so it sat in the home for a couple of weeks until Terry, the, their adult son of the family, he started playing his guitar and the sphere started to react, started to vibrate and hum. And kind of were. And soon after, it started to move on its own, of its own power, and follow people around the house, and it kind of displayed this personality. The The family was convinced that it had some kind of intelligence to it. Um, and so this, this story started by them sharing it with their neighbors, but soon it hit the, the local media. Um, they had a, a uh, late night radio guy who kind of did the local Jacksonville coast to coast radio show. Um, his name was Ron Kravitz. And he remembers going out and seeing the ball. It was um, sitting in the middle of this table. And as he and um, Jerry, the matriarch of this family, were leaving the room to go out back, the ball rolled from the center of the table all the way to the edge of this this flat table and kind of dangled there in this gravity defying way, as if to say like, "Hey, don't forget me! Like, I want to go outside too." Almost like a, a pet cat or a pet dog. Um, and the family really kind of started growing this affinity towards it, treating it almost like a pet. And soon it hit national news. It became this national news story. And the Navy got involved and UFO investigators got involved, famously J. Allen Hynek, um, who's one of the, the fathers of ufology. He dates back to Project Blue Book in these early 
research efforts into the the field. Um, he researched the ball on three separate occasions, um, hands-on investigations. So it it was really the story that kind of captivated the um, the the nation for just like a couple months. It was really like over a spring, not even like a month. And by the end of this World Coaster month, it had been debunked and like the story was kind of over. And the family was sick and tired of weirdos showing up at their house, their phone ringing nonstop. You know, it's the 70s, so you can't get a phone call while you're getting another call, you know. So um, Jerry, the woman who owned this house, she owned a real estate and a trucking company. So she had these successful businesses she was trying to run, and it was getting totally, you know, sidetracked and, and derailed by this UFO stuff. And then there was several incidents involved of, of supposed treachery. But we'll get back to that in a second. Um, my involvement was, um, you know, hearing that story and being like, okay, cool. You know, let, let's go check this place out. Let's go to this island. Let's go see this, this uh, house where this supposedly happened. And I couldn't find it. And that was the first thing that kind of like, you know, uh, touched my interest. I asked around. I even asked the park service, like, "Hey, where the, where's this house?" Um, and they they led me to this other house that wasn't it. And um, I couldn't find it on that first trip. the The island was definitely strange. Canopy trees, really thick foliage, some really old historic houses. There's a church. There's the the Rebalt Club. Um, there's Kingsley Plantation at the very end. And there's these stone structures, these tabby ruins up and down the island that were former homes for slaves who who used to work on the plantation. And past that, it was homes for sharecroppers. And so this island has a lot of history. It's a lot, very, very strange setting foot on it. And trying to find more information on this house, I discovered that the house had a second paranormal file, as it were. There was the story of Jerry Betts and the Betts Sphere, this famous UFO story. But the house that this story took place in was known amongst a very small community of, of ghost hunters and urban explorers as the Neff House. And it is a, uh, a house that long before Jerry Betts moved in had these strange ghost stories attached to it. And so after I found out that, I had to go back to the island and really find the house. And I used some satellite imaging and, you know, found some some patches in the forest that could have been the house and kind of traced my way from there how to, to find this place. Um, and eventually I did. It's hidden in the woods, sitting on top of this hill, um, which is strange in itself. It sits atop the highest point in um, Duval County. It's uh, Mount Cornelia. It's not really a mountain. It's more of a hill. But in Florida, we don't have a lot of hills, so we, we tend to exaggerate. Um, but of course, very strange already. And the the house itself, even though it's in this demolished, semi-built state now, it still has this air of like a medieval castle. And it really looks like it'd be at home on a, a hill in Bavaria than in a swamp hidden in the woods in Florida. It's got this, it's Trudor style. It's got the white and brown wood. Um, it's got stone. This conical tower is the entrance point. It, it really does look like a, a little castle sitting in the middle of, of the woods. And so when I first walked up on this house, I was like, oh shit, like this is, you know, it's a very rarely do I go to I go to a lot of haunted places but rarely very rarely do I go to one and it has immediately that palpable like feeling of of strangeness of, of weirdness and this was one of those locations right off the bat and so I decided to continue to sneak onto that land and sneak into that area it's government um, owned it's in part of the the parks department Though no one at the parks department knows who exactly is in charge of it, which is a, another issue that um, I'll discuss later. Um, but this this house is, is past this no trespassing little barrier. And um, despite that, I, I decided that, you know, government land, I pay my taxes. <laughs> That's technically mine, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's how that works. Um, and so I 
I, I bent the rules, I'm going to say, so I could study this historical um, house, you know, I call it journalism. And so sometimes journalism requires the, those bendings of the rules. But let's get back to the, the haunted history of this house. So it was called the Neff House. And that's because the man who, who had it built was named Nettleton Neff. And he was a um, railroad engineer who worked up his way to executive based out of Chicago. And he um, had summered, though, in Florida and in Jacksonville and was a member of the Rebalt Club, which is one of these, these clubs there on the island. And he, there he met Mellon Greeley, who was um, and is considered the dean of Jacksonville architects. Um, and this is in the, the 1920s where like being an architect's like the fanciest job, you know, there, it, it's like a Gatsby type party, you know, <laughs> club here at the Revolt. Uh, everyone's playing golf and drinking booze and smoking long cigars. And Mellon Greeley is the guy who built this club and he's the best architect in town. And Nettleton Neff approaches him with these rough plans. He's bought a patch of land on the island. He's bought Mount Cornelia. And he wants to build this elaborate home on it. And Mellon Greeley sees these plans, but he gets inspired by them. And he draws up blueprints for them, but he draws a separate set of blueprints, which he thinks encapsulates what um, Neff is trying to, to build much better. And this is the set of blueprints that ends up becoming the house. And it is a strange structure. It's got 21 rooms, um, seven different levels. There's all kinds of step ups and step downs. It's um, three stories in a basement, but it's got lots of weird shifts. It kind of rises and falls with the slope of the hill. Um, and again, and it's built in like like a castle. It really isn't uh, this almost medieval structure. Um, Renaissance era let's say, because it has the, the beautiful Trudor accoutrements, the, you know, the pointed ceilings and um, white and uh, brown wooden paneling. And um, even today it's, you know, it's not kept well, but it's, it's still a stunning structure when you see it. But the, the Neff family never got to move into this house. Tragedy struck their um, existence First, Nettleton's wife died in a mysterious fire at one of their other properties. The newspapers called it mysterious. No source was ever determined or how this happened. Next, their adult son, who was away studying at Harvard, he disappeared for two weeks and was found dead hanging in an apple orchard. It was ruled a suicide. And finally, Nettleton Neff himself took his own life in his office. Um, and this was right when the, the house was finished. The, their boxes had moved, been moved in. The, the house was ready to be lived in, but they never set foot. Um, he was survived by two daughters. It's said that one of the daughters also took their life later on. Um, and then the final daughter did visit the home once, according to Greeley, but there's no comment on, on how that visit went. But as that house sat there, it began to collect stories especially because the, the 30s hit and the Great Depression hit. And suddenly this affluent Gatsby party of an island is no more. The golf course is still there, but now it's pretty shab it, it becomes pretty shabby. And by the 90s, it's completely closed. There's no even remnants of it now. You might see a patch of white sand that used to be a sand trap um, as you're walking through the trails, but you're walking through a forest today, you'd never even recognize that it used to be a, a plantation or a golf course. Um, and this area kind of, people still live out there and they still live in these these kind of large and well-built houses from the, the turn of the century. But it, it it's no longer the swanky hangout of Jacksonville's elite. Um, it just kind of becomes a, another place. And the house begins to collect ghost stories. People begin to hear organ music and a telephone ring out, even though the telephone line isn't connected. They, and there's never been an organ in the, the house. They begin to see lights and shadow figures in the, the empty rooms of the house. It becomes kind of the place of, of the local urban legends, the spooky ha house up on a hill. Uh, it really fits the cliche of the house on Haunted Hill. 
people begin telling these stories and it dates back further to the island. It goes, if you go back to the plantation era, there's all kinds of ghost legends originating from that time. Old Red Eyes, this legend of a slave killed by other slaves for cruel misdeeds, um, it supposedly haunts the island. If you go further back, it's where Jean Ribault, the French explorer, first landed and said the first Protestant prayer in North America, um, which no matter your beliefs has all kinds of incult implications. Um, and on that line, island, while Rebolt was there and long before was the Timucua Native American tribe. And there's all kinds of legends around these tribes. And when you drive through the islands or driving through the shell middens, they're very much still, the mounds are still intact. And there's a lot of speculation that Mount Cornelia itself is partially constructed. Um, so, it, again, you have the cliche of built on an Indian burial ground. Um, others believe there's a, a lost slave graveyard somewhere on the island that no one's know, sure where the exact location is. Um, but in that patch of woods is is figured the best spot because it's between um, the Rebalt Club or between the Kingsley Plantation and where most of the residential houses is this big patch of woods. And so all these ghostly legends surround the house. And in the 70s, that's when Jerry Betts arrives. And she is actually, she's running her, her successful companies. And it's the 70s. It's a very difficult thing for a woman to do. Uh, she runs for state house. And there's like this super sexist article written, how will these women keep house if they're elected? <laughs> like, it's really you know, tough time to be an enterprising woman as she was in the 70s. And while discussing a film project, she hears about this spooky house out on Fort George Island and she's like sold, like I'm I'm in. You know, she sees this super unique home and she's this super unique individual. And so it's kind of like this match made in heaven. She's like, hell yeah, I'm moving into the haunted house. Let's like go for it. And again, awesome. 10 out of 10. She's the the protagonist you hear about in like the scary movies. You're like, why would they ever do that? <laughs> who would ever do something? She she's the lady who would do something like that, right? Outgoing, charismatic, and she experienced a lot of haunting activity, poltergeist stuff, you know, uh, dishes shattering themselves, uh, teleporting out of locked cabinets, um, doors slamming. She'd see strange lights on the 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 property and hear strange voices. But she always had a rational explanation. She always said, oh, you know, it's the house shifting or there must be phosphorus in the soil. And that's what's causing the the weird lights and the, the voices, the whispers, they're coming from the channel. It's, it's boaters and it's just being carried up the channel and we're just hearing it, these weird echoes. Um, again, really interesting character and that's you know she talked about it and there was even a little interview with her about living in a haunted house um, and that all occurred before the sphere the sphere even entered the question so then the 70s hit the 74 hits and the sphere shows up and again it kind of takes off um all from local news to national news and she gets the navy involved and she has the Navy sign this contract when they investigate the sphere that if they determine that it's not Navy technology, that they'll return it to her. Um, and supposedly on the day they were returning the sphere, she gets a call at the house and there's like some other top brass military official being like, hey, when the, the guy with the sphere gets there, have him call me back. And she's like, okay. She hangs up the phone. The guy gets there, hands her the sphere. And it's like, oh, you know, it's you got something weird here. Don't know what it is, but it's definitely strange. And then she says, oh, yeah, there was a call for you. You got to call this guy back. And he calls this guy back and Jerry sees him getting chewed out over the phone. He's getting yelled at. You know, it's a lot of Kurt. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. And immediately when he hangs up, he's begging to get this sphere back. He's like, we really need it back. I'm sorry. It's like this emergency. And she says, no, she's like, you signed the contract. You know, you said it's not a danger to anyone. It's not radioactive. So we're keeping it. And um, she, the, the Navy 
they gave the family a, a report that said, yeah, something weird was going on. But after they got shut down, they were released to the media saying, oh, no, there's nothing going on with this fear. The classic, like, oh, no, totally my day. It's perfectly balanced. So if you, like, tap it, it'll roll in all kinds of directions. That must be what it is. Nothing to see here. And soon after, the newspapers found a guy who worked at an industrial manufacturing. They made parts for big industrial machines. And he had these metal spheres that were roughly the same shape and size that were for paper mill pumps, like this weird gasket type pump deal. And he said, yeah, that's that's one of our spheres. And then the news kind of ran with it and shut this whole story down. Well, right before this happened, she sends the sphere to New Orleans to get investigated by J. Allen Hynek and this panel of other scientists. Um, it was a really weird panel put together by the National Enquirer. There's a couple of paranormal um, names on there um, from Leo Sprinkle to Hynek to some famous characters on this panel. Um, but they were, were looking into the sphere and Terry went, the, the adult son who had found it, he went with one of the other sons to, to this conference. And that's where some treachery occurred. Um, someone called the panel impersonating Jerry Betts and saying there was this huge emergency that they, the, the sons needed to return immediately. And this was right after they handed over the ball to Hynek to do these tests. And so they, they flew back to Jacksonville because they couldn't get Jerry on the phone because the phone kept being blown up by reporters and UFO buffs. And uh, it was becoming a serious problem for the family. People were just showing up at the house at all all uh, times of night, <laughs> kind of like just knocking on the door, being like, hey, where's the sphere? I want to like see this this UFO you have. They, she, Jerry Betts had gotten in the habit of leaving the phone off the hook just so it would stop ringing at this point. And so when they couldn't get her on the phone, they were like, well, she called and said to come back. So let's go. Like, let's hop on a plane and like make the quick flight. Jacksonville to New Orleans is, it's not, it's like an hour most. And so they take the flight, they get there, and they show up at home, and Jerry's like, what, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, we got the call. You were panicked and freaked out, and you said to come home. And she's like, no, nope, I didn't call. Where's the sphere? You left the sphere? Go back and get it. Like, she was pissed. And they went back to this panel, and they took the sphere and left immediately, because they were convinced that the UFO panel was up to no good. Um, and this is because the panel was set up that they would give 10 grand to anyone who could prove a UFO was or undeniable evidence of, of UFOs. So Jerry, she wanted answers. She was a successful businesswoman. The money didn't mean anything to her. She just wanted to see if these guys had any better answers than the Navy. But she thought the panel, because of this, was trying to jip her out of the cash. Like they were trying to fuck with the sphere and you know not pay her and not give her answers because they didn't want to pay this. What's interesting is that those phantom phone calls and those weird impersonators is something that pops up a ton with um, John Keel and his investigations. And so the Mothman and other MIBs and things like that, where these phantom phone calls and impersonators, I think even a, oh, there's a more recent researcher who had one of these experiences where someone showed up as a conference impersonating him. And like did the rounds and like shook hands and handed out cards pretending to be this other investigator. Um, and th this is a detail that pops up again and again in these high strangeness cases. And Heineck himself felt so bad about this incident that he actually went out to the island and stayed with the family and like tried to, to heal relationships. And that this is another point of the story where there's multiple versions. Uh, there's one version is that they, the family in the middle of the night while he was out there staying at this house, the family caught him messing with the ball and like caught him in the middle of the night. And there's this speculation that the ball was swapped out and Heineck may have even stolen it. This actually stems from Heineck's son who was doing a press tour pretty recently for a Project Blue Book TV show. And he mentioned that as a kid, he used to play with this metal sphere in their basement that came from a UFO case in Florida. Now, we're not sure, obviously, if that's the same sphere, but that's a pretty damn strange coincidence. 
So there's the speculation that Hynek stole it. There's the speculation that the Navy um, messed with it or altered it in some way. But we know that by the end of this month, Jerry Betts had felt that someone had messed up the sphere. And she even went to get a second set of x-rays done on the sphere, which found that there was some kind of internal damage um, when compared to the original x-rays. So it was either swapped out or messed with, um, and it seemed to be losing its its strange abilities by the end of this month. And also, Jerry was tired of it, right? She had these businesses to run. So when the, the newspaper started running, oh, it's a hoax, like these people are making it up, she was like, okay, fine, as long as I can, can stop talking about it. <laughs> like, I've got other shit I got to do. Like I thought this was just going to be like a fun, weird thing. You know, it's a weird ball we found, but this is, this is outrageous. And so she kind of leaned into the, the canceling of it by 85. She had moved out of the, the castle, the Betts castle, Neff house. And um, it began to collect ghost stories again. It began to be this spooky house on the hill, but less and less people, especially as the golf course closed, Um, We're going out to the island and looking at this house. And so it kind of, in the recent decades, it fell behind this this blanket of foliage and has kind of been forgotten. It definitely shouldn't be because uh, that the next bit of information I found that really convinced me to pursue this case further um, was its relation to some of the new Navy videos, the Navy UFO videos that came out. You know, everyone's been losing their minds and discussing these videos. You know, are they real? Are they fake? But they've missed a pretty bizarre coincidence in these discussions. So two of those famous videos, you have the Tic Tac video, which was filmed in 2004, and that's the David Fravor one. Uh, he's the guy who went on like Joe Rogan and talked about it. And he's, he's kind of made that case famous. It's the Tic Tac and it goes in and out of the water. Quite bizarre. Um, the other two are the gimbal and that one's kind of become the face of these UFO videos, right? That's the black saucer looking one that kind of rotates in that weird way. Um, it's kind of the, the face of these Navy UFO videos because it looks like a flying saucer. It really is that classic saucer shape. That one was filmed in 2015 and it was filmed by the crew of the, uh, well, a a flight crew running training missions off the USS Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier. But the aircraft carrier was um, stationed at Mayport, which lies just across the St. John's River from Fort George Island. It's the same naval station that investigated the bet sphere. Okay, kind of, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the gimbal footage wasn't the only footage they filmed that day. They also filmed the third video that was released, the Go Fast. And on the Go Fast video, it shows a metal sphere traveling incredibly fast right above the Atlantic Ocean. It's just above the water and in the video you can see them they're struggling to capture this this um sphere with this high-tech camera and there's all these arguments from skeptics oh it's a weather balloon whatever you could see these pilots are struggling like they're uh, scanning with the camera to try to keep up with this this object as it moves that's why it's called the go fast and again all these discussions about this video no one seemed to notice that in this exact same location, only a few miles away, the Navy investigated one of these metal spheres hands-on. Forty years ago, one of these metal spheres popped up in the exact same area, and the Navy was extremely hands-on. And interestingly enough, I, from there, I decided to dive into um, Mayport Station's history and see if they had any other bizarre encounters with UFOs. And not surprisingly for people who are into these subjects, I discovered that, yeah, they absolutely had had prior incidents with UFOs that um, even J. Allen Hynek at the time wouldn't have known about. And 
you know, in retrospect, clearly are relevant to to this conversation and to these, this case. Mayport Naval Station had scrambled fighter jets in response to UFO flyovers. They hadn't just seen a UFO here or there. They had been buzzed by UFOs close on and had reacted with fighter jets. And so when you consider these details, you consider that before the Bet Sphere, they had one of these incidents. Then they investigate one of these spheres hands-on. Then after they have another incident, and they just so happen in 2015 in this exact same location, film a couple of these objects. And no big surprise, you know, the military knows more than they're saying. Everyone kind of knows that. But in this situation, it seems like we know, we can see that there's certainly a trend here that needs a little more explanation than we've been given so far. Yeah, so clearly the the amount of coincidence stacked up there is, is quite bizarre. It's one of those situations which, um, you know, researchers are familiar with when it comes to locations like Area 51, Groom Lake, you know, your Nevada, your New Mexico air bases and things like that, you know, that have these histories of, of high strangeness. Um, but the Betts case has always kind of been written off as, oh, it was, you know, probably a hoax, just some metal sphere. There's no grays walking around. So, you know, it's it's not considered as as good of a case. But when it's examined and when I looked into it further, it became obvious that it is one of these cases of, of high strangeness, that it isn't as simple as a, a write-off. You know, there's no reason the Betts family would lie. They had no incentive to create this weird hoax story. And judging by the activity that was already going on in their house, it very well could have been a variety of paranormal phenomenon, not even related to UFOs. You know, the, the Navy stuff is quite interesting, but it could necessarily have been a, a normal mundane ball. It could have been a, uh, a a sphere that kind of acted as a planchette on the Ouija board that is this strange house. You know, the, the tul- tulpa energy, those that thought form energy could have occupied that sphere and it could have just been the the focus of the the poltergeist activity. You have similar cases in the UK with like um, what's it, Jeff the Talking Mongoose, where it became this strange mongoose type character that was almost more like a pet than like a super spooky ghost you see in like the Conjuring movies, and it, it kind of had this this type of behavior. It didn't. The Betts family described it as intelligent, and when other witnesses described seeing its behavior. It wasn't described as like intelligent in the way you would think of an extraterrestrial intelligence, right? Not operating robotically or mechanically, or it was operating intelligently like a cat or a dog. It was moving around with this, you know, kind of playful, curious attitude um, that was more mammalian than extraterrestrial. Um, so there's a, a large variety of, of possible explanations to it. And uh, again, those are the cases where I just can't, I can't stop looking at them. And so I decided to, to go and do several investigations at the house, including an overnight um, where I tested out some pretty bizarre ghost hunting technology. Um, and I'm really skeptical of this stuff, that stuff on the whole and I still am when it comes to, to this device in particular, and we can get into the, the theory and behind it. Um, but it was the perfect device to test out at this home. It, it fits the, uh, the case perfectly. And I didn't want to do any of my classic psychedelic experiences or anything like that, because uh, I, I, I heard a good sound piece of advice one time, and you should never break the law when you're breaking the law. Uh, you know, if you got if you got a body in the trunk, use your blinker, <laughs> right? And so, if you're trespassing on a, in a haunted house, try not to be off your face on psychedelics at the same time. That was my logic behind it. Um, some shows have asked me why I didn't do my psychedelic experience. Here's my response: uh, 
But um, yeah, I, I discovered this bizarre ghost code device um and it's from this inventor from the uk kind of eccentric dude named patrick jackson and he's got this um this theory he calls quantum paranormal um have you ever heard of this uh this guy (laughs) no but uh the quantum paranormal thing sounds familiar yeah, it's, it's well, it's one of those names where you, there's probably a couple quantum paranormals out there, right? Yeah. Um, it's it was actually one of the red flags for me when I was looking into it. Is he uses the word quantum pretty high and loose, you know, kind of like a, how a comic book writer would use quantum or radioactive back yeah. in the day. <laughs> Anytime some kind of superpower or magical thing happens, oh, it's quantum. It's using quantum mechanics to do that. Um, But Patrick Jackson, he's a a ghost hunter and an IT guy from the UK. And his theory, quantum paranormal, is that these, I'm going to call it ghost code theory because I can't do the quantum thing. I'm going to call it ghost code theory because that's the app and that's the device. Um. He um, believes that these spheres, these metal UFO spheres, are responsible for all paranormal phenomenon. He's got this overarching, and I think you'll find this intriguing, uh, <laughs> theory that, yeah, the starting, he starts at the Foo Fighters, and where you have these spheres, and they would kind of phase through the walls of planes and check out these pilots and you know, the Nazis thought it was the Allies, the Allies thought it was the Nazis, and it was this this kind of strange World War II mystery long before it was a pretty okay alternative rock band. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, he starts there and states that this was the time that some kind of ET presence came to Earth and implemented these the sphere system. And it's a system of spheres that are essentially probes satellites that are close to the ground they don't stay up in the air because you know our airplanes and stuff would would fuck with them um so they're they stay low to the ground and they stay in abandoned and uh supposedly recently abandoned in long abandoned haunted locations because they give off trace amounts of radiation and so they want to scare humans away they don't want to be around um humans so that's why they only operate between midnight and 3 a.m Got your witching hour in there. Get your checklist out, ghost hunters. <laughs> they only operate between uh, midnight and 3 a.m. They go to abandoned buildings and graveyards and hospitals and things like that because they're tr- collecting trace amounts of human DNA. Um, that's what he says. <laughs> um, they occupy these abandoned buildings. They're usually in the basement or the attic, again, because they want to be as far away from humans as possible. But, you know, sometimes they're around them. Um, <clears throat> and he believes that these spheres, they can turn invisible. That's one of those quantum powers. <laughs> they can phase through walls, another quantum power. Um, and basically do all the things that a ghost can do. And he came to this conclusion after doing his own investigations at the um, Black Monk of Pontefract house in the UK, um, where he collected some images of some like ghostly mists and shadow figures and things, where at the center of them, when he, you know, puts them through certain filters and things, he sees, you can see the sphere. And so since there's a sphere um he uh believes that that's the invisible ghost sphere and it's just creating the mist and creating these other things to scare away people um he says that's why evps are always in the language you speak right if, even if it was a ghost from the you know early 1600s that spoke you know dutch the evps always seem to be in english right get out run away um, and that's not because it's pareidolia. You're not just hearing that <laughs> what you want to hear. No, 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 no. It's because the sphere is running an AI program that's trying to decide what the spookiest thing to say is. And that's why sometimes EVPs make no sense is because it's kind of like talking to a chat bot. <laughs> it's a UFO chat bot. And that's what EVPs are. Um, 
So again, he's got it's a fun theory. Get your checklist out. He believes it covers all your ghost hunting bases, um, including the idea that um, he compares. And so this was actually one of the more interesting things, though. All right. So clearly there's it's not the best theory. All right. I'm going to relent here and say, yes, there's probably some holes in this theory. Um Oh, I know you're. I know you have your own tools to poke holes in that, but my experiences alone will whoosh, shatter that altogether. Yeah, please, please <laughs> give me one. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> now, where do psychics come into this theory? How do psychics that can communicate to the other side, unless they're to, to what that object is talking to them? But then again, why are certain people uh, have this ability to talk to the other side versus a an average person? Or are they just singling these people out? And then are these fears always around someone who's psychic? Since someone who's psychic is always talking to the other side at all times. Hence, like, my co-host and wife, yeah, uh, Megan, to this group. Great questions. Yeah. I Again, I don't know. You'd have to ask Patrick. And I don't think he gets into <laughs> any of those um, specifics in his book, Quantum Paranormal. At least I don't recall any. Um, but I would assume it had something to do. It's kind of probably a similar idea to like the chosen people who get abducted i would say he probably thinks psychics are kind of like that and they can tap into the weird network of ufos or whatever i don't know i'm not sure again it's not the best theory (laughs) (laughs) um but right i'm looking at this house and and what are the stories of the house Uh, well it's haunted it's really haunted it's been haunted for a long time also, there was this big metal sphere inside that used to move around on its own and do a bunch of weird shit. When you apply, when you look at that case and then look at the theory, well, there's, you know, obviously crazy theory, but it's so crazy it might work, <laughs> right? For this exact scenario. Um, it, it seemed almost too synchronistic to not at least try it out. Um, but there was one other aspect that I found in particular uh, very interesting about his research. And he's got all of these videos of ghost orbs and he compares them to UFO orbs flying around. And so now I'm a, a Florida based ghost hunter and I've seen some strange light orbs. I've been out to Marfa, Texas, seen some strange ones. My girlfriend's seen one on Brown mountain. Absolutely. Physical light orbs that you see absolutely part of the part of the phenomenon but being a florida-based ghost hunter i see a lot of you know night vision camera images of ghost orbs and i would say 95 percent of them are bugs Hmm. they're bugs the bugs catching the light it's reflecting it's a bug um but he's got these videos of these these ghost quote-unquote ghost orbs And they're flying around in these weird movements and shapes. And then next to it, it's a UFO sphere. And these are legitimate videos of UFO spheres moving around. And they are moving in the same pattern. And that's super intriguing to me because of B theory, as we discussed a little bit at the start. And go back to whatever previous episode that was to to hear the whole in-depth on B theory. But the idea is that you know, insect parts are used to build UFOs and that it's the similar physics that bees use are the same physics that these craft use and they're just human built craft. Um, And so there's these videos of these spheres moving around in the same way as bugs fly. I found particularly interesting. I totally opposite of what Patrick Jackson thinks is going on. He's convinced that, Oh, clearly that means ghosts and UFOs, same thing, which I'm not necessarily disagreeing with him, but I think that piece of evidence is, is more, it's more intriguing when you consider the fact that these craft are flying pretty similar to how insects fly. We, we often hear the impossible physics thing, like, oh, nothing can stop on a dime like that. Um, nothing can, you know, go in and out of the water and up and down like that. Well, no birds and no planes can do it. <laughs> That's an important distinction. There's several flying insects on our planet who can do the exact same thing those craft are doing, except scale down on a mini thing. If you were to fly like several, like a variety of insects fly you'd be your brain would be a mush on the inside of your head you'd have all kinds of weird concussions and g-forces and stuff 
the insects are all right. So there is, it's not entirely unknown physics. It's not understood physics, but it's not entirely unknown. So I think Patrick Jackson might have accidentally stumbled onto a, a higher truth with those weird videos. Um, but either way, I decided I had to try out the ghost code theory um, in the Betts house. If there was any place to prove this theory or to even just test it out, this was the location, right? Abandoned house has a history of spheres, has a history of hauntings. This guy it, it hits all the bases of this guy's theory. Um, and so I, I bought the app, um, $8, $9, expensive app. Yes. Uh, bought the app and I borrowed the ghost code device, which was this interesting 3D printed plastic electronic device. Um, I, I wanted, I asked him how much it would cost to buy one. Um, and let's just say it was too expensive. <laughs> um, well, one might say unreasonable. Um, but I was able to borrow one from a different team um, who I've, I've worked closely with. Um, who who has one of these devices and they've used it to some success um you can actually check out um uh the skunk ape experiments um it's a new amazon i think it's on amazon um they're releasing like an episode a month docu-series where they're doing some pretty cool psychedelic experiments and ghost code theory they're trying all kinds of stuff to try to manifest the sasquatch uh, <clears throat> it's really interesting stuff but um, they had one of these devices and I was, they were kind enough to loan me it um, to try out in this, this bets investigation. Um, and it definitely, you know, there was some weird stuff. I went in pretty skeptical um, and I'm still skeptical. I don't think the device. Uh, so supposedly the device runs this signal that attracts the UFO spheres. That's how it works. You use the app and the device together it boosts this signal out and it makes the UFO spheres react. It makes them fly to, to the device and check it out. And then once it gets there and sees there's a human, that will start doing paranormal stuff to try to scare you away. Um, again, fun, fun, fun theory. Um, I don't know how much it works. Well, I guess I do know how much it works in practice, but I hate, I hate to do it to you to find out my experiences with the, the ghost code device. Inside the Bet's house, you're gonna have to check out the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta leave something, something there. Um, and yeah, that that book is a place between time and space. Um, it's a true story of UFOs, ghosts, um, and Florida's strangest home. But it's actually that strangest home um, that I really want to hit um, home about. Uh, because it is in danger. That house, uh, as we've been talking, it sits on government land, um, and it's kind of been forgotten. No one at the Park Service knows who's in charge of it, um, and it's kind of just sitting there collapsing slowly. Uh, and just the architecture alone is enough to get it recognized as a landmark, right? It, it, lots of Mellon Greeley's buildings all around Jacksonville are already historic landmarks. You know, even if you don't care about ghost stories and UFO stories, it's still a fascinating piece of history. It would be a great addition to the cultural park. You have the Rebalt Club, you have the um, Kingsley Plantation, and in between the two, you have this literal castle. <laughs> you know, it's a castle, which is crazy. We have so few castles in the U.S., um, and so that's why I started a petition to get the house recognized as a historic landmark. And so hopefully we can get it preserved um, for future generations. So, you know, ghost hunters, UFO buffs, and just your normal history nerds, class, classes uh, going on field trips. This is a piece of history um, standing on a, a historic site. And it should be um, enjoyed by everyone. So, you know, if you don't want to get the book, screw the book. Please go to the petition, the change.org petition, Save the Bets House. Um, I'm sure the link will be in the description here. And just just sign that, you know. Finally, a non-political issue everyone can get behind. Let's save this piece of history for for people who love strange stories. 
Um, because it's, yeah, it's one of these places that's really a place that should be experienced. You know, I'm really fortunate and glad I can tell this story. Um, and people seem to be enjoying it and, and reading about it and, and sharing it. Um, but it's, you know, really should be a, a story that's best experienced. And, uh, you know, we can't all trespass <laughs> illegally onto a, a piece of history, we should definitely preserve it and do it the right way. Um, so, yeah, I apologize for doing it the wrong way. And now I'd like to right that wrong by getting this petition going and hopefully starting uh, down this path of, of getting the house recognized as the, the landmark it is. Most definitely. I don't know me and Megan signed it and we'll definitely uh, put the uh, link for it uh, in the description of the episode. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a, a weird place, and um, I definitely think it would be a a, a fun place to investigate um, in the future. It'd be great for for not only ghost hunts, but you could put a museum in there. Again, it's really a crazy structure. It's got these grand halls. It's got a bunch of fireplaces. It's it's truly bizarre. Um, you can see pictures of it on my Instagram at Chads of the Dead. Um, I'm going to be posting some more pictures up of it um, this week. And yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a place that I, is, is worthy of, of the intention. Um, and it's, it's worthy of being, uh, saved. So please take a little, little bit of time out of your day and, um, save some spooky history. Most definitely. Chance, I do appreciate you coming on again. Like I said, you're welcome back anytime and hopefully you set the record for most times on the show. Um, <laughs> where can everybody find your book? Yeah, you can find it at um, Amazon or you can find it at paranormalitymag.com, uh, uh, <clears throat> the den.paranormalitymag.com, uh, where you can also find Paranormality Magazine. It's a great monthly publication. Um, they do all kinds of awesome, weird stories. It's community sourced, so feel free to send in your own stories, experiences, um, projects, those kinds of stuff. Um, they've been great. Awesome independent publishing. Um, support those guys, and they great enough to publish my book, and are going to be publishing some more in the future. So go check out all of those projects at paranormalitymag.com. As for my stuff, you can find me at Chaz of the Dead on all of the social medias, no spaces, and Chaz of the Dead.com to find all my articles, podcast appearances. There's a link to my Patreon there, um, my books. Um, there's some other stuff too. I can't remember right now. So go check all that out. Um, child of the dead.com. And yeah, thanks for having me on, man. You're welcome. And as always, we'll catch your widows in the next one.